Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Warm Flash, and this is another Flash Moment in Medical Science. Today's topic, we're going to talk about Tetralogy of Fellow, which is something that we also discuss in a more broad video dealing overall with a congenital uh, heart disease, and specifically cyanotic congenital heart disease. But we're going to go into it from the perspective of how you would deal with this, and especially how medicine got started managing uh, such a condition and, and managing cyanotic congenital heart disease overall. Because it's a really horrible situation when there's a baby born and just cannot get uh, oxygenated blood to the tissues because... Uh, deoxygenated blood is uh, mixing in and the, ana and the anatomy is just not right for that circulation. So let's delve into it. Now, let's, let's just imagine it's a century ago. Say we're at the turn of the 20th century. They couldn't do anything for something like this. Babies would be born with cyanotic conditions. A lot of them were tetralogyophilo. Now, epi epidemiologically, tetralogy is the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease. Now, that's not actually the most common congenital heart disease at birth, because at birth, sometimes the diagnosis hasn't really kicked in yet, because it takes that, that progression of the anatomy in the days and weeks following birth before the child would always become cyanotic. He or she may not be cyanotic at the beginning, and that's why, in terms of at birth, the most common condition causing cyanosis is actually transposition of the great vessels. But actually, in the early days, when they had what they called blue babies, meaning babies who were cyanotic, well, they would deal with it the same way. And in most cases, we were talking about tetralogy, but it could have been transposition and it could have been something else like truncus arteriosus or any of the other cyanotic congenital heart conditions that we've discussed. Now, in those days, let's say the early 1900s, if a child was born and would just be cyanotic as soon as the child started breathing, it was really, really a grim prospect. There wasn't much that they could do except wait and see how long the child would have to live. Untreated, tetralogy fellow has a mortality rate of uh, 30% during the first two years of life, and then it goes up to 50% by the end of six years after birth. But now imagine that it is the early 1940s, and somebody has a procedure that has been attempted and proven hundreds of times in laboratory animals and now for the first time it's being tried on a human infant with tetralogy who is cyanotic or going through a cyanotic episode and all of a sudden the operation is complete and the infant turns pink no longer cyanotic you would be amazed and that is the the setting to which I want to bring you, to give you the appreciation for what, what can be done. And in our days, this is just maybe a first step before more extensive repair. So let's just go through, first of all, what, what is Tetralogy of Fellow? Okay, this is something that was actually described back in the 17th century. In the, the late 1600s, there was a, a Danish... Uh, anatomist and physiologist and physician, Niels Stenson, uh, who kind of described it, but in Copenhagen, but sadly he doesn't get the credit. The credit actually goes to Etan, Etan Fallow in the 19th century is a physician who described it in terms of these four features. Why Tetralogy. Well, in Greek, tetra, you know, you hear that, and that has something to do with the number four. And actually, going way back to ancient times, uh, tetralogy was what the, the ancient Greeks called uh, a collection of four plays where you had three comedies, I'm sorry, three tragedies 
and one comedy, which is the more familiar term trilogy. That's where you have three, three plays. So there we go. We extend it to the number four. Um, but with tetralogy, we're not talking about plays. Of course, we're talking about a constellation of, of four features here. And that's what Fallow described. You know, and we know this from our more broad discussion of cyanotic congenital heart disease, but let's just quickly review. The four features are you have pulmonary stenosis, or there's some kind of uh, narrowing or obstruction to the pulmonary outflow. So one way or another, blood doesn't get into the pulmonary artery, in which it has to be in order to go to the lungs. And you also have a ventricular septal defect. So there's a connection, usually a pretty big one, between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. You also have an overriding aorta. That means that the aorta, instead of being just getting that outflow from the left ventricle, it's kind of getting the outflow both of the left ventricle and the right ventricle because it overrides the ventricular septal defect, that, that hole between the wall that's supposed to be between the left and the right um, ventricles. And then because there is all this happening, you have uh, a connection between the left and the right ventricles, and you have the blood not able to get out of that right ventricle, at least into the pulmonary um, artery. And so the pressure is elevated inside the, the right ventricle higher than it's supposed to be, and that elevated pressure leads to right ventricular hypertrophy. So that's the fourth feature of these four features. So let's go through them again. We got pulmonary stenosis. We've got a ventricular septal defect. We have an overriding aorta, and we got right ventricular hypertrophy. And so because of the right ventricular hypertrophy, you might you will see things uh, such as on electrocardiography, ECG, you're likely to see right axis deviation because of that. You can tie all this stuff together. You're going to have uh, a, a, a systolic murmur, pan-systolic murmur, because of these connections between the two sides of the heart and the, the very turbulent blood flow. Why all these different, four different features all at once in the same thing? And why is that so, you know, common, at least compared with cyanotic congenital heart disease uh, overall? Well, it's actually because of the four features, really, they're all part of the same one thing that goes wrong. Namely, in development in embryology, when the, when the septum is forming, you have, a, you have a muscular part and you have a membranous part and they're, they're supposed to kind of come together, and they're kind of misaligned. And the misalignment causes that, that incomplete septum, which is, is open here, there's a ventricular septal defect, and it, it causes the upper part, the membranous part, to be pushed over to the right, toward the right side of the heart. And that kind of pushes in the 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 pulmonary valve, the developing pulmonary valve. And so that's why you get pulmonary stenosis. It's also why you have a ventricular septal defect. And it's also why you have an overriding aorta because it's also pulling the, the other uh, big artery over toward the right. And usually it doesn't come all the way over. It ends up coming kind of halfway over between the, the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So there you have, you got the four features all from one problem. Now, they were being called blue babies in, in, uh, in the old days. Uh, there were a lot of uh, babies called blue babies who didn't have tetralogy. Anything that gave you cyanosis, you would be called a blue baby in those days. And how could they possibly deal with it? Well, keep in mind that in the early to mid 20th century, they, they, didn't, they couldn't really do anything inside the heart because there wasn't any time. They didn't have a way to bypass blood flow um, uh, around, around the lungs and, and stop blood flow through the heart. The way we do now, there is cardiopulmonary bypass. So 
surgeons are able to operate on the heart for hours inside the heart. Uh, they, they, they can open up the heart, do open heart surgery. Um, couldn't do that in the early decades of the 20th century. But there was this idea about, well, maybe you could do something with the great vessels. And that's still a challenge because you might have to clamp a great vessel briefly. And there was a cardiologist, Helen Telsig, who just had the idea, well, maybe we could do that. But before we get to her, it's kind of, let's go, let's back up a little to this whole big issue because it's kind of a fascinating story. It actually goes back to somebody who did not have any formal training in surgery or medicine, but he was actually an amazing surgeon. And he was born in 1910. His name was Vivian Thomas. And he was born in the Jim Crow South and he was African American, which is in being in the Jim Crow South as, as an African American, it was a really, it's really tough uh, to, to move up in society. But Vivian Thomas had this dream as a child to become a doctor, really wanted to be a doctor. And that was his intention all the way through high school. And when he graduated from high school in, uh, in, in Nashville, Tennessee, where he was living by that time, but that's still the Jim Crow South, um, he still had that idea of becoming a doctor, and he would kind of work his way through college, and he got a job as a carpenter, and he was saving up money to, to achieve his dream of becoming a physician. Um, but, well, that year, 1929, might sound familiar. That's the year of the, the, the big crash on Wall Street, the stock market crash triggering the Great Depression, and... Uh, his life savings, he, he lost all that in the Great Depression. He lost, really, the ability even to do that carpentry job. And he was desperate, desperately looking around for a job. But he had a friend who was working at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and in the medical school who helped him land a position in a, in a research lab. And that research lab was the lab of a, a fairly young surgeon, Alfred Blaylock, a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, which was already by that time, Johns Hopkins was the place to be. And Blaylock actually um, just possibly missed out on doing a surgical residency at Johns Hopkins because uh, he was kind of in the middle of his class and kind of known to be kind of a, a party animal. He liked to have those parties and such. So he, he, he ended up doing a, a residency in, in, uh, in Vanderbilt, and then he stayed at Vanderbilt and started his surgical career there, which he wanted to do research, a lot of research, and he needed a really capable research assistant, and he found one in Vivian Thomas. The two hit it off. And it turned out that after uh, just a few days of doing this, Thomas had this, this inner wonderful surgical talent. It was just natural. You know, Blaylock thought he had it kind of better than Blaylock himself had it, despite all that training. He was just so good with his hands. And within weeks, he was kind of designing surgical procedures on the laboratory animals that they were using, mostly dogs. And they were developing all kinds of procedures. And it was getting to the point where Thomas would just kind of get in there in the morning and he'd start everything himself. He'd do the surgical procedure himself, and he was kind of creating step by step the procedures, really giving Blaylock kind of guidance on how how to do this, how to try this. And they were going from one research topic to another. And while they were at uh, at Vanderbilt, there was a time when they were working on a study where they needed to simulate um, pulmonary hypertension, that's high blood pressure in, in the, the vascular system of the lungs. And the idea that they came up with was, well, what if we take a high pressure part of the circulation, the aorta, and, and, and make some kind of a connection with the pulmonary, the way that when you have a patent ductus arteriosus, uh, you get that high pressure transferred, which in the long run, if that stays, you know, like that, you're going to get Eisenmenger syndrome, where the, even though you have at first a um, a left to right shunt, the high pressure 
in the pulmonary system leads to high pressure uh, continuously higher, and then you got a, 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 an evolution of the vasculature so that it's fibrotic and stenotic and high pressure there, causing eventually high pressure on the right side, and then the shunt switches from left to right to right to left. That's Eisenmenger syndrome. We talk about that in the other videos. But they, they wanted to simulate just pulmonary hypertension. So the idea they ended up coming up with is you connect, not the aorta, but one of the subclavian arteries, so a major uh, branch of the aorta, to either the pulmonary artery or one of its branches, like the branch on the same side. So what they would do is they would take, let's say, the left subclavian artery and attach it to the branch of the pulmonary artery on the same side. So that would be the left branch of the pulmonary artery, or you could do that with the right subclavian and the right branch of the of the pulmonary artery. Now, for the, their research purposes, it didn't really go over so well, but keep this in mind, it's going to come up later, because now, by the end of the 1930s, they end up moving. But stuff was not so great for Thomas. Being an African-American and being a, a lab assistant, he was kind of treated by the university as kind of a janitor, paid like janitor wages and classified as a janitor. And there was a point when Blaylock was offered a position at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit when it really would have been a move up for him. And he would have had control of his research and hiring people. But the only thing was that Henry Ford Hospital would not allow him to bring uh, his assistant Thomas with him because Thomas was African-American. And Blaylock said, no, I depend on this guy completely. And so he stayed around for a little while longer at Vanderbilt, but then he ended up getting an offer from Johns Hopkins, his alma mater. He moved there. He brought, he brought Thomas with him. And at first, same situation. Thomas was kind of treated as a janitor because he was African American, but he was developing these amazing surgical procedures, developing things and doing hundreds of operations per month on dogs. Uh, that it, he was so good at it that veterinarians would, would start bringing cases to him. Please, we need help with this dog or this pig. Uh, if it was someone who needed a farm animal thing, he was really considered to be a surgical expert in laboratory animals to the point where he could do clinical veterinary surgery. Uh, fortunately, there was a little bit of help at Hopkins because a famous neurosurgeon, Walter Dandy, ended up donating money that would then give a, a salary raise to, uh, to Vivian Thomas. And this brings us into the mid-1940s, about 1943. There was a concerted effort to try to do something about the blue babies, about cyanotic heart disease, especially tetralogy of Fallot. And that's where we bring in the cardiologist that I mentioned, a pediatric cardiologist, Helen Telsic, who was at this meeting that involved Thomas and Blaylock, and they were talking about what could we possibly do? Is there any kind of surgical procedure that we could do? Now, they couldn't open the heart and try doing what surgeons do now after they do what we're about to talk about to kind of palliate things, moving the septum, filling in the septum, opening up that, that uh, pulmonary valve. But what what... Talisig's idea was, well, you know how plumbers rearrange pipes? Could we not kind of rearrange the pipes? Is there something we can do? And she was talking about the great vessels on the outside, and there was an aha moment between Thomas and Blaylock. They were, oh, of course, what they were doing a few years ago at Vanderbilt with connecting up the subclavian artery and a branch of the pulmonary artery, they're like, whoa, you know what? Uh, for a model for doing pulmonary hypertension, that didn't work so well for research. But yeah, you get blood flow from that high pressure system of the left circulation by way of the subclavian into one of the branches of the pulmonary artery. This would bring blood uh, from the left side of the of the circulation to the right side, into the pulmonary vasculature where it needed to be in these cases so that the children could then um, get oxygen. 
Now, let's go through just a few things about the cyanosis in 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 tetralogy. The 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 classic way that it presents is in these episodes that are called tet episodes, and it generally brought on by activity such as a crying or feeding, where the child then, while crying or feeding, will suddenly get horribly cyanotic. And they would sometimes often learn to then alleviate that cyanosis by squatting, because what that does is increases the afterload by squeezing the femoral arteries in the legs, and that would kind of raise the pressure on, on the left side and the, and the afterload is increased. And so blood is less likely to want, some blood, less blood wants to go through that aortic valve. And so some could be diverted to the pulmonary valve, but that's just a very temporary measure. So the idea of Tausig was, yeah, could you reroute it? She wasn't a surgeon, but she's now talking with, with Blaylock, the surgeon, and the surgical genius, Thomas, and they moved forward to, to do that and started developing the procedure more. Um, Thomas did this on more than 200 dogs, and they were finally ready toward the end of 1944 in what's now a very famous operating room called the Heart Room at Johns Hopkins, where Blaylock was all scrubbed up for surgery, and the patient was a, a, an infant named Eileen Saxon, and she was she was a, a victim of tetralogy. She was cyanotic all the time, or frequently, and just continuously, so she had this blue look. And even though Blaylock was all scrubbed up, he looked around, he said, where's, where's Thomas? I can't do this without Vivian. So he unscrubbed, got out, went out, Thomas wasn't there because it was assumed that, well, as an African-American and with no formal training, he wasn't going to be allowed in the operating room. But Blaylock went and got him. He actually needed him to guide him through the every little minor step of the procedure because it's actually Thomas who had developed the procedure. Found him, came back in, he re-scrubbed back in, and went through the procedure and connected up the subclavian on one side with a branch of the pulmonary on the other. When he took the clamps off, immediately little Eileen went from blue to pink. It really looked like it worked. And, and for, for a few months, she was doing okay. Uh, but then she, she, she started to deteriorate. Uh, deteriorate. Um, the operation was done in November of 1944. In early 1945, she was becoming more cyanotic. So they went in and tried to do the same procedure on the other side with the other subclavian and the other branch of pulmonary artery. And that was only very uh, uh, temporarily uh, successful. And she eventually passed away uh, close to the age of two, I think. Uh, but subsequent children on which they, on whom they operated, in in the in the months and years after that, they had a lot of success, and it was really working. And now today, this is a really the main initial palliative procedure on a lot of cyanotic congenital heart disease. It's a little bit different the way they do it today. When now they first did it, they would take the entire uh, left or right subclavian and then anastomose that to the either the left or the right pulmonary branch, depending on which you're using. And what they do now, instead of disconnecting that subclavian, they, they create a, uh, they use a, go a Gore-Tex material and actually put a, a connecting shunt in there. But either way, you're bringing that, that uh, subclavian blood, under, which is under high pressure, into the pulmonary uh, circulation and that, that can palliate the child for a while. Now, in those days, that was the only thing they could do. Now, later on, as the, the child gets older, then they start fixing all the uh, various problems uh, with the tetralogy. Well, and that, that's sort of how it got started. And, uh, well, I, I, as this kind of went on, because, because, um, because Thomas was, he was really teaching uh surgical residents, junior residents, the, the university 
was gaining a respect for him, uh, even though near near Blaylock's death in the mid 1960s, he came to terms with a big regret that he had, which was never having sent Thomas to medical school. Uh, Johns Hopkins eventually awarded Thomas an honorary doctorate. It wasn't in medicine, it was in law, but it gave that it allowed the the surgical residents at least to call their instructor doctor. Uh, so, you know, really fascinating history there. And it maybe by thinking about that, it might keep you cognizant of all the, the main challenges of how, how you can restore um, oxygenated blood flow in somebody born with, with such a, a catastrophic condition. And we can get into that on additional video lessons. See you next time.